first off, are there any unfinished comments that you would like to uh, add to the summary of this conversation? Well, I can tell you what a prairie dog's worth. Uh, on one of our projects, uh, uh, alongside 89 between uh, Hatch and Kanab, uh, somebody come along, saw our crews working there, reported it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We got a cease and desist order the next day. It took us nine months to get it resolved. The result was they said we took a prairie dog. And I said, show me the carcass. And they couldn't produce the car carcass. But in negotiations and getting that project back started again, uh, we had to pay $20,000 to the National Wildlife Defense Fund. Wow. So don't run over any prairie dogs and let anybody see you with any authority. Any last comments from you? Yeah, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, in getting environmental impact statement approved, we reached out to all the stakeholders, whether it be like uh, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, uh, the Nine Mile Coalition, uh, cultural groups, and so on. And, you know, and we finally got it all resolved, and we met many times with all those, uh, those parties. And uh, in the past year, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance has now filed lawsuit against the BLM and the Interior for our environmental impact statement, even though it took us eight years to get it done, and we went ahead and followed all procedures. And, and here's the very frustrating part of that. If they prevail, they'll get reimbursed with either Juan's budget and federal dollars or with monies that you'll have to pay because of the uh, Equal Access to Justice Act. Right. I mean, yeah, we've already spent half a million dollars on the attorney, so we'll be spending more now. So that's something to stay tuned for because we're working on uh, something special on that. Uh, comments from the audience? Have we got you tongue tied or? Yes. <laughs> Juan, this one is uh, basically for you, <laughs> but uh, okay. help us understand here. Uh, we've got two examples here, and we would have had a third, where it takes seven to eight years to complete the environmental impact study process. Uh, expenditures on the part of the company of two, three million dollars, sometimes <coughs> more, to go through that. And recognizing that, yes, we do have concerns with environmental uh, issues and uh, endangered species. We don't want to run roughshod over all those kinds of things, but in a perfect world, if you had the staff and uh, we could bring common sense, throw Baca out the window and uh, just uh, do it in a common sense way, how much could that time and cost be reduced? In other words, how much room have we got to work if we could really address the issue and bring more efficiencies to the table? You know, I think that Mike explained at least uh, two years. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is uh, the other part of the time is that sometimes the surveys that we need to do on the ground can only happen, for example, flowering plants can only happen in the spring. So if you miss that window of time, you just lost some time. There are, there are other parties in, that are, have to have input into this processes. EPA is one, Fish and Wildlife Service, and those take time. So to answer the question that was asked, how can we improve all of these processes? My answer would be is that we need to bring all of the federal agencies, which we seem to be in different departments. Now EPA is a whole different department than the BLM, which is the Department of Interior. The Forest Service is a whole different department of agriculture. So some of us that deal with natural resources are scatter about government. So, so we need to be able to figure out a way so that we're not as agencies reinventing the conversations, redoing the discussions, redoing the decisions. We need to come together as one federal family, no matter which department we're at, and be able to process some of these documents uh, in the same time frames as others. Rather than linear, I do my part, I turn it over to the next one, they do their part, they return it over to the next one, they do their part. We, I think we need to do it at the same time uh, that's one answer to be able to cut some of this time that I believe can happen and should happen. Would it be possible or even feasible to uh, say have U.S. Fish and Wildlife set the guidelines and again delegate authority and responsibility to the BLM and just say here's what we're after you you deal with these parameters and make the decision and we'll be good with it. Wouldn't that be, a, wouldn't, couldn't they be in more of an oversight capacity and at work? 
Uh, yeah, that's, that, that certainly could work. You know, as, as it is right now, the process is that when we, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, create a document, an environmental impact statement as an example, then we turn it over to the Fish and Wildlife Service, who has to do Section 7 consultation, and that takes time for them to do that, uh, for good reasons. Uh, but I think if we were to do it at the same time, or fairly close to the same time, that would certainly save some time. Gentlemen? Well, Chad, you get, speaking about the sage grass, you've got the BLM and the forest and, and the state working very hard on that project right now, and they're going to come to a recommendation, and they're going to turn it over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're either going to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and that's going to be it. And in my opinion, it's, it's a way to keep people off the land, whether it be grazers, whether it be power line builders, whether it be gas and oil people, or whatever, it's going to be a land control issue. And that's just my opinion, but I think it's shared by a lot of others. Uh, I, would, I would endorse that uh, in this crowd, uh, uh, many of whom I know, uh, that there would be great agreement with that statement. Uh, your final comments? I, you know, just an example where um, Juan was coming about streamlining the process. And, and that would be, for example, we recently, I went back, let me start over, we went back in November and let the Vernal Field mm -hmm. Office know that we were going to have a rig moving on in July. And met again in January, and then met again in February, and nothing was moving. Finally, it was crisis situation. And so finally got, you know, fire lit, and, and we were able to go ahead and, you know, get the paperwork out of the Vernal Office to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office for the Section 7 consultations. That process normally takes 45, 60, even 90 days. We got it done in two weeks, okay? And it's only because I created a sense of urgency that I've got a rig coming and I need to go ahead and get it. I've already committed to it because you told me that we're gonna be able to get this done. And that just shows you that where Juan's come from. I mean, the linear process could shorten the process, but also that sense of urgency. I mean, we all go ahead and we got our permits, everything is fine, but it just took a little bit of a push. You know, in contracting quite often, uh, if a contractor doesn't doesn't make his deadline, uh, he starts getting charged a penalty against what he's supposed to earn. It happens in highway construction and building construction. Uh, I, I don't mean to burden you further, Juan, but it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but John, I, I just can't uh, leave this conversation. No, the West is coming up to the podium too. But I want to say uh, to, to all of us that there's great stuff going on here in the state of Utah of us working together. Yeah, let me just cite a couple of examples. So with Mike Styler's staff and a whole bunch of other counties and the BLM Forest Service and others, we have restored well over a million acres of land from Pinion Juniper here in the state of Utah. That is a great accomplishment that we've done. There's some great stuff. Another example that I can tell you is over the last uh, 18 to 24 months, we have approved right at about 5,000 new wells in the Uinta Basin for oil and gas. We are in the process of uh, approving another 5,000 new wells in the Uinta Basin. That is a significant amount that we've done. In addition to that, I think that we have done a tremendous work together with all of us on some of our recreation tourism here in the state of Utah, which is really important part of our financial portfolio for the state. So I, I just want to make sure that we don't leave this conversation believing that the sky is going to fall on our heads. There's a lot of great stuff that is going on. And I really do believe very deeply that together we can solve these problems. Uh, and and uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to be able to meet face to face in order to see eye to eye. And uh, I'm committed to that. You know, I, I put a lot of miles on my vehicle. I travel to a lot of parts of the state. I visit with a lot of people. I am convinced that we can solve these problems if we're willing to sit down and talk about them. Well, I'm all in favor of talking to uh, whoever it is up the ladder to get you more autonomy in your position. Thank you. Uh, folks, thank you very much. Uh, Wes, thank you for the extra time. Uh, we appreciate your being here at the Rural Summit. These are important issues, and thank you for those of you who have been supporting our program for these last four years. Uh, you know, when we hear comments about the topics we're covering, we're very grateful for your kind comments and words. Thank you also very much. Thank you, Carl. If you like this video, then we invite you to subscribe to our channel, The County Seat. You can do that here. And we invite you to share with your friends. 
We also invite you to get all the latest up-to-date information by following us on our social media channels. And if all else fails, make sure that you watch the county seat Sunday morning at 8.30 right here on ABC4 Utah.